it's amazing how many of these videos are started when somebody calls me up and says how do I do this or can I do that with this piece of equipment and I say sure and I'll explain it to them and I'll say gee there has to be somebody else out there that has that same question maybe I can help them out a friend of mine called me and he wanted to know how he could figure out the timing on the contacts on some relays that he was going to use to protect the preamplifier but he didn't have a digital scope and he was having a real hard time figuring out or seeing the timing on the contacts so we made a little test set up here we have a very cheap archer relay from way back in the day I probably bought that thing when I was 14 years old and it's genuinely a cheap piece of junk so this ought to demonstrate the problems with the relays very well here so what we've done is we've set the coil up with a push button switch here so I can actuate the relay and then release the relay we've thrown a protection diode across here to protect the power supply from the back EMF of the coil and you don't want to neglect that you want to put at least a 1000 PIV 1 amp diode across the coil the kickback from these coils can be in the hundreds of volts depending on the current and the number of windings so we have our plus supply through our button into the coil back out through our ground return I have also connected the power to the coil this happens to be a 9 volt coil 9 volts to the common contact or the armature on the relay and we will connect channel B of the scope first to the normally open contact down here we'll put our probe down here the ground and the scope will be common with everything else the clip lead on the scope will be common but B trace B will be looking at the normally open contacts first and we will find out how long it takes the armature to close these contacts and you're going to find that most relays have some bounce when this armature comes down and slams against this contact typically it doesn't close instantly there's going to be a couple of bounces before the contact is actually made they overcame this in the 40s and 50s on teletype equipment which had to have extremely fast relays by using a mercury wetted contact it was actually a type of liquid surface contact and once they were made even if the the armature bounced a little bit the mercury would maintain the contact those have gone out of fashion today because we all do everything like that with solid state but when you're running high power and protecting a preamp up on the tower it's still very very common to use a uh, mechanical relay so we'll find out what the timing is for this to close we will also find out what the timing is for this set of contacts to return and that's typically slower because there's going to be some residual magnetism in the uh, solenoid in the coil or excuse me the metallic center of the coil and it has to this spring has to overcome that residual magnetism when the current shuts down and pull this contact away we will also take a look at the normally closed contacts and I think we're going to find that these are much slower to respond after the switch release than the normally open contacts take to respond when we close the switch when we put energy into the coil that is it's going to be a lot faster pulling in than it is to release once we've de-energized the coil that's pretty typical relays are pretty complex mechanical little devices and good ones are expensive for a reason I think we're also going to find there's a lot of bounce on this set of contacts but we will time out the normally open contacts for closure and opening and we will time out the normally closed contacts for opening and reclosing and again we are going to trigger from channel A on the switch closure and measure the time delay through channel B on these two contacts and I know somebody out there is going to say why don't you wire the power to these two and take a single reading here and I would be able to in theory test both closing opening op closing opening on both sets of contacts with one test setup you can do that if you've got a digital scope 
and you can lay everything out on the screen and store it and, and analyze it, you could do that. But with all the switch mounts, even with a digital storage scope, it would be tough to distinguish where the actual closing was and where the actual opening was because there's going to be so many bounces on the screen. And we'll see that here in a minute with this old analog scope. Okay, here we have my old 2465B Tektronics, and this is arguably one of the best oscilloscopes, analog oscilloscopes made. It's one of the last Tektronics, <coughs> excuse me, uh, one of the last Tektronics that had a full service manual available for it. It's a 400 megahertz analog scope, four channel. Of course, it's got on the on screen uh, measurement stuff. It's really a shame you can't get your hands on these anymore. Um, and these are dying. There's not an awful lot of them left in operating condition. They have a problem with a vertical amplifier. And no replacement parts available unless you have a part, a scope to, to uh, scrounge parts out of. And it's really a shame. They are beautiful oscilloscopes. And once you've had a good analog scope in your hands, only the most expensive digital scopes can even compare with the trace you get on these. Now there are, you know, advantages to having a digital scope for capture and so forth, but when you're looking at analog signals or AM envelope, it's hard to beat an analog scope. Okay, I digress. As you saw in the schematic, <clears throat> I have a push button wired to activate the coil. Now right now, we are on plus trigger in other words when I go to normal mode or single shot mode the trace is going to trigger on the up rising voltage we're on channel 1 for triggering DC coupling right now we're running auto so that we have a trace on the screen that's running continuously I have channel 1 turned on I'll turn on channel 2 in a minute we're at 500 millivolts per division because it's a 9 volt coil and I have a times 10 probe which means this is going to be 5 volts, this would be 10 volts, two divisions would be 10 volts or it's going to be 1 volt for every hash mark here. So if I close my switch you can see we have 9 volts which is what the coil operating voltage is. Drops back down, back up to 9 volts. So that's going to be our trigger. Now I'll turn on channel 2, and I'm going to move channel 2 up to the same position. Now remember, this is wired right now across the normally open contacts. I'm actually going to shut off channel 1, because this scope allows me to, continue to still trigger on channel 1, even though channel 1 is not being displayed. And we're looking at channel 2, and we can see the switch closure. And the switch, the car, excuse me, the contact closure on the relay. And when I press the button, now what actually what we're seeing is the contacts, the normally open contacts being made. But pretty hard to see what's going on. We see some noise over here, but we're not really seeing what's happening. So let me darken the room here for a minute. Okay, we've darkened the room, and what I'm going to do is turn up the intensity on the uh, on the trace or on the beam or remember we're on plus triggering we're triggering on channel 1 and now the scope is in normal mode so when I press the button it's going to trigger the sweep and the sweep is starting from the first vertical division as is normal for an analog scope. The trigger point is going to be the first vertical division unless you're using a time delay or introducing the delay. But normally you're going to set up your trace to start either at the first vertical division or at the edge of the screen. I like to come into the first vertical division. We're at two milliseconds per division and I hope you can see my big fat finger in there. So from this first vertical line is to be two, four, six, eight. So we're going to have eight milliseconds to the center of the screen. Now I'm going to depress my button, and I think you've got a pretty clear representation of that contact closure. In fact, I'll turn up the trace even a little bit brighter. And you can see there's a bounce, a second bounce, a small dropout, and then the contacts are finally closed at roughly 
two, four, six, eight milliseconds. So it takes eight milliseconds for those normally open contacts to go closed when the coil is actuated. Let's do it one more time. You can see there was a small bounce just before the eight milliseconds. So you cannot legitimately say those contacts are made. That's noise from the switch, don't worry about it. Those contacts are made legitimately at about eight milliseconds. One more time, bang. That was very clear we had a dropout just before the eight milliseconds. So let's see how long it takes those to open when the coil is de-energized. I'll turn the light on here for a second. I'm going to go over, oh no, excuse me, I'm being stupid. I am going to go from positive triggering to negative triggering. So now the scope will trigger reliably when the voltage drops across the coil. And there you see two, four, six milliseconds for those contacts to go open. Actually, it's longer than that. If we do this again, you can see there's some slope right down here at the bottom as the contact resistance goes higher and higher and higher as they pull apart. So I would not call that fully open again until nearly eight milliseconds, two, four, six, eight. If you want to you know, be 100% sure that they've gone fully open, it's a six and a half milliseconds, but, or uh, two, four, six, yeah, six and a half, I would go eight, seven, or excuse me, not six and a half, seven milliseconds, I'm being stupid today. I need more coffee. Of course, if I have more coffee, my fingers are going to shake a whole lot more. So that is the normally open set of contacts opening when the, when the button is released or the coil is deactivated. So let's call it all in all 8 milliseconds for opening and closing on those contacts. Now let's take a look at the normally closed contacts and once again I am going to trigger on the plus side so when the coils actuated bang we can see that's opening very quickly the normally open contacts are opening very fast it's pulling away very quickly as we wouldn't expect them to let's go down to 500 milliseconds per division and try that again so there's one millisecond two milliseconds is the center of the screen you can see by two milliseconds, those contacts are fully open. Remember, we're working with a 400 megahertz scope here. So that's a fairly accurate representation of the contact resistance. But we can pretty much say, safely say that it one, two milliseconds, remember it's half of, it's 500 uh, microseconds per division now. So that's one millisecond, the center of the screen is two milliseconds. At two milliseconds, those contacts are reliably open. That's the normally closed contacts opening. Now let's go to negative triggering and take a look at how long it takes those to reclose. I didn't see anything. I, so I'm going to slow this down. There's one millisecond, two milliseconds, five, there's 10 milliseconds. That's a little bit too much. There we go. So we're looking at five milliseconds per division and closing. So five, 10, 15, 20 milliseconds before those normally open contacts reclose. From the time the solenoid is deactivated you're looking at a 20 millisecond delay before those normally closed contacts reclose. Now, if that was protecting the front end of your preamp, in other words, if that was the connection to the front end of your preamp, that's actually desirable. They're opening in two milliseconds, which is very quick, and not closing for 20 milliseconds after you drop the key, which gives everything plenty of time you know, your RF power to fall off and so on and so forth so you wouldn't be feeding anything back into your preamp so for that part of the circuit that's pretty desirable however on the normally open contacts which would be bypassing or drawing the RF around the relay or the preamplifier excuse me 
I would want a little bit more reliable contact closure and that's where an expensive relay comes into play. They'll, they'll have less bounce or the duration of the bounce. If you could get it under oh, four to four milliseconds for those contacts to close and carry the RF on the normally open set, it would be desirable. So I'm going to release one more time and as you can see it's clearly, clearly slow when they reclose. 5, 10, 15, 20 milliseconds. Whoop, that was even longer. There was one that was even longer. Let's try that again. 20 milliseconds. 20 milliseconds. Yeah. At any rate, there you have it. By darkening the room, turning up the intensity, and triggering from that first line, you can get a very accurate representation of how long it takes those contacts to close and open and how many bounces there are before they are fully closed. Hope you found this useful. Uh, hope this saves you some heartache. And if you liked it, please give us a thumbs up. A subscription is always appreciated. They're free. They don't cost you anything. And the more subscriptions, the higher the ranking is, is in YouTube, and the more people are going to find us. Thanks for stopping by. As always, I'm the Radio Mechanic. See you.